Just suppose your parents never gave you pot training. Think it out. You've got to do your thing. <laughs> Two things would happen. Today, you would hate your parents for never having trained you. And secondly, you would hate yourself. So you are what you are today simply because your parents laid hold of you and said, You're go we're going to train you. They didn't allow you to do your thing. Now if I've made myself clear up to this point, you're living in an age where freedom is described as license, the right to do whatever you please. But that's chaos. If everyone did what he drove a car as he pleased, we would have disorder in the streets. Certainly you can do whatever you please. You can stuff your Aunt Maisie's mattress with old razor blades. You can turn a machine gun on your neighbor's chickens. Then freedom becomes just a, a physical power. Then the one who is most free is the one who is most strong. So the world has changed. We used to have laws. We had obedience. We had discipline. Today, no boundaries, no limits. And you're not happy that way. Now, there isn't a boy here, because you are more interested in games than the girls are. But when you play games, and it's true of the girls in a limited way, you have boundaries, you have limits. You've got foul lines on a basketball court. You play baseball, you've got lines running into the outfield. You play football, limits, boundaries. You couldn't have fun if someone, for example, was picked up the football and ran outside of the field. You say, no, you can't do that. We've got limits. Well, why don't you respect it in other things? If that's the way you want it in games, why don't you want it that way in life? Then we're happy. Now what is the one thing in this free world, thanks to the press and television, that is the major interest of the young? It's sex. So let's talk about it. Today sex has become almost mental. Every advertisement has to use it so that you are inclined always to think about it. What is it really? Well, the reason you want to know about it is because it's a mystery. What is a mystery? Well, a mystery is a sacrament. As a matter of fact, the Greek word mysterion is the Latin word sacrament and the English sacramentum and the English word sacrament. Now what is a sacrament? And then we'll understand sex. Every sacrament or every mystery has two elements. First, physical. Secondly, spiritual. Something that is visible, something that is invisible. Take, for example, baptism. What is the physical side of baptism? Water. What is the invisible side of baptism? The cleansing of the soul to make us children of God. A word is a sacrament. Because there's something audible. And then there's something invisible about it, namely the meaning of the word. Take, for example, a pun. I don't know whether I can think of one at the moment, but... Oh yes, here's one. A little girl was once asked, what are you going to do when you get as big as your mother? And the little girl said, diet. <laughs> now you see, you laughed at that. Now why did you laugh at that? If, if for example, a horse heard that joke, the, 
The horse wouldn't give a horse laugh. Why do you laugh? Because in addition to hearing the sound that a horse would also hear, you got meaning out of it. You got purpose. The Eucharist is a sacrament, the mystery. Something you can see, bread. Something invisible, the presence of Christ. Sex is a mystery. There is something physical about it. Everyone is either male or female. It's that simple, period. Not at all complicated. What is the invisible side of sex? What is the mystery? It's a mystery of love. And it stands for something spiritual. First of all, sex stands for God's creative power given to people. So he gives the creative power to a husband and wife. Instead of directly creating us, he says to a father and mother, I will let you share my creative power. And you will give life. This is the spiritual side of marriage and of sex. But it also stands for something else. When you girls and boys get older, someday you'll hear, come to the altar. You'll be married. And there will be a reading from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And this is what you will be told. Every bride stands for the church. Every groom stands for Christ. Think of it. God intended that in marriage the husband stands for Christ. The bride stands for the church. Does that mean that the that the man is the head of the woman in the sense of domination? No. The man is the head of the woman in the sense of sacrifice. So as Christ gave himself up for his spouse, his bride, which is the church, so the husband sacrifices himself for the wife. Now that's the spiritual side of marriage and of sex. It therefore refers to love, human love, between husband and wife, the love for God, the love for the church. 